Hawaii is one of the most beautiful places in the country to live. But it's also one of the most dangerous if you're a pedestrian. Why? Who's to blame? Is it speeding drivers? Are pedestrians not paying attention or taking too many risks? What can be done and when? How do we solve this problem and save lives? Join the conversation about dangerous crossings. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lara Yamada. Pedestrians killed by vehicles. The numbers so far this year are up, way up. This graphic tells it all. 38 so far this year, 15 in all of last year, 32 in 2016, 27 in 2015. So is there an explanation? What, if anything, has to change to save lives? Tonight we have with us a representative from the Honolulu Police Department's Traffic Division, a traffic engineer, a spokesperson for an education resource for pedestrian safety, and the head of a nonprofit dedicated to empowering Americans 50 and over. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can call or email, email, call or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. From the Honolulu Police Department Traffic Division, Captain Ben Moskowitz. Ed Sniffen is the Deputy Director of the Highways Division of the State Department of Transportation. Lance Ray is a public relations executive and represents WalkWise Hawaii, a state entity that promotes pedestrian safety statewide. And Barbara Kim Stanton, director of AARP Hawaii, who has extensive experience in government and community relations. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight. And, and really, a thank you because you all have been involved in this for, for so many years. And I think it really takes that, people who have been dedicated um, to doing this for a long time. Because this is, a, this is a tough problem. This is a tough problem. And I think one of the big questions tonight that we want to start off with is not only that this is a problem, but uh, why are we having this problem? And um, you know, we've been talking about some of the numbers and showing some of the numbers. And that's a tough question to answer as to why we're having such a problem right now. Who wants to start? Well, it's tough, but the reality is we're just not paying attention to each other. You know, as pedestrians, we're distracted while we're walking, and as drivers, we're also distracted. You know, many of us are told not to, not to operate our cell phone in a vehicle, but we do so. Many people do so. Uh, we tend to daydream. We tend to eat while we're driving. And we're not paying attention to our primary task as a driver to get from point A to point B safely. And also as pedestrians, too. Today, just, just driving around today, I've seen so many pedestrians in a marked crosswalk, you know, following the light, but they're wearing earbuds and they're looking at their phone and they're completely distracted. And if there was a driver perhaps going through the red light, they would not have heard that driver and might have been struck. Or if they weren't have the earbuds on, they might have been able to jump out of the way. So I just think both sides were just distracted and were not paying attention. Yeah. That's, that's really right. true. Yeah. <clears throat> because, you know, when you look at Hawaii, and we think, we're scratching our head thinking, why are the numbers so high as far as pedestrian fatalities? And we look at some place, we think, well, okay, it's because we can walk outdoors most of the year. We have, um, you know, we have an aging population, high percentage. But you look at Florida, and they have the same thing where they have a big mix of the locals and the tourists. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of sunshine. And yet, Hawaii's uh, pedestrian fatality rate is about twice that of Florida. It's about, it's, we're near 5% versus Florida, which is, you know, about 2.8% per 100,000. So there's something really wrong when you think we have basically the same elements. But we agree um, with Lance. We think people are distracted. And we really, we really have the three correct needed organizations here because we really think it has to do with the three E's. It has to do with education, like walk wise, enforcement, HPD, and the engineering has to be smart and that's DOT. So I mean, we're really talking about the three E's and how to make it take root. Well, I think what's a little bit curious <coughs> is when you look at some of the, um, the spikes and the drops in the numbers, and I think when people are trying to look for some type of trend or pattern of some kind, um, I think overall, 
there's definitely issues within the population that we're, we're seeing, whether it's here or elsewhere, as far as the inattentiveness, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to trying to pinpoint, which you oftentimes have to mm -hmm. try to do, um, and look for patterns, what can you talk about? What, what, what are you looking at? And what have you been able to kind of pull from that? Yeah, you know, it's a challenge, um, especially in the city and county of Honolulu. We've had 26 yeah. of those 37 or 38 pedestrian fatalities. Um, so a large portion of them are ours, where the majority of the population is. But the challenge, especially this year, um, different from last year or the year before, is these aren't necessarily people that you might classically think of or the viewers would consider to be pedestrians. They're not necessarily people who are crossing the street or people who are at intersections or at crosswalks. Some of them are, absolutely. Um, but there's just been a really bizarre number of high other types of pedestrians. So from our point of view, uh, we're going to consider a pedestrian to be anyone who's injured or dies in a, in a collision involving a vehicle who's not either on a bicycle, a moped, a motorcycle, or in another vehicle. Mm -hmm. Anybody else is a pedestrian. So we had a tragedy where two young men were killed at the side of the road President's mm -hmm. Day weekend uh, by a drunk driver. Right? And this year, they were on the side of the road changing a tire. You might not classically consider them to be pedestrians, or when you say pedestrians, that's not what comes to mind. But when it comes to tabulating people and adding numbers into totals, they get added into that total. Is that is that a more recent <laughs> addition, though, or is that has that always been the case? That's has always been, been the case. There's not, the that, case. That's not yeah. a no. possible explanation for some of it. It's just no. um, what you have to think about as to what's being Correct. When, when you put that label pedestrian okay. on, I just want to make sure people are clear that we're no, not talking necessarily yes. about people in I crosswalks. I don't I ever realized that. Yeah. Yeah. Within a period of three okay. weeks, we had three different people walking across the freeway between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning, wow. struck by motorists. Wow. Uh, those are really, really hard to prevent from an enforcement standpoint. But again, those are, are numbers that are, or those are people, but those are numbers who are going to be counted in this conversation of pedestrian fatalities. And I think we have some video, we have some uh, various different uh, bits and pieces. One is of, of, of Jay Walkers. I think they got, they got quite a few, actually, that maybe we can show some folks. But um, yeah, I, I mean, Ed, when, you, when you think about trying to figure out, trying to look for some type of trend or something, mm -hmm. something you can kind of focus on. What are you, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? So when, for us, we look at um, where accidents occur, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we generally consider when we have high volume, high f speed facilities with high volume of, of pedestrian traffic, that we consider we'd see more pedestrian fatalities there. That's not always the case. Um, that trending that we look for, um, just, it just doesn't pop out at you. But one of the biggest trends we always find, though, is the majority of the pedestrian um, crashes that, that end up in fatalities occur at night. Mm -hmm. During the dark hours of the, of the time, from 6 to 6, that's when the majority of the pedestrian um, fatalities occur. Is that different this year compared <coughs> to other years? No, seeing just more of them occur. Yeah, so yeah. of the 38, mm -hmm. okay. only three were not, not during the, hmm. the dark hours. I guess that's not too, that's not surprising. Yeah. Uh, and by dark hours, you know, we mean it from dusk <coughs> all yes. the way to dawn. So Which it's, sometimes it's still, dusk is yeah, or... It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, st it's still light outside, you know, but they're just not visible. Mm -hmm. so. so those are the things. When, when we start looking at things, <coughs> as Lance was saying, the responsibility lies on both sides. Definitely, the vehicle driver, we, we got to understand the responsibility we take every time we get behind the wheel. When we get behind the wheel, we're in a potentially deadly vehicle every time. And we got to understand that. The awareness that we take from it is um, the same that we, we should have when we're walking around with a firearm. It's the same thing. It's that deadly. We gotta make sure we understand that. From the pedestrian side, we gotta understand that there is not always somebody in control behind the wheel. We can never assume that when we're walking across, somebody will always stop for us. There's sometimes medical emergencies that don't allow somebody to stop. There's sometimes vehicular emergencies that don't allow somebody to stop. So we can never take it for granted. So on both sides, we gotta make sure that responsibility is held with us. We gotta, as drivers, take care of everybody on, on, outside of us. As pedestrians, we really gotta take care of ourselves. Let me take a look at some numbers here. We have a, a few graphics. <coughs> um, I think this is breaking down county by county. And it kind of emphasize <coughs> what we've been talking about as far as when you're, um, when you're in the more populated areas, <coughs> of course you're gonna see higher numbers. Mm -hmm. um, here's a, this is a county breakdown of the pedestrian fatalities so far this year. Not at all surprising. I guess it's just on this monitor here um, behind you. Um, Oahu having the most numbers, <coughs> 26 there, but also kind of taking a look at some of the other counties, Hawaii County, Maui County, Kauai County, um, some numbers popping up there as well. And, and that's about normal for the past that's 10 about years. Typical. It's kind of okay. that variation. So We've not, had no some, particular yeah, trend nothing popping up there crazy either. Up there, about the same, yeah. <coughs> okay, so we have another graphic here. This one focusing on Oahu <laughs> and showing a jump in, jump in pedestrian fatalities this year. 
uh, from last year. So far, um, 26 so far compared to 12 last year. Pretty significant jump. 10 in marked crosswalks. Um, <clears throat> And the last time Oahu lost so many pedestrians back in 2005. So this really seems to be following along the trend of um, what we've been seeing as far, as far as these kind of spikes and drops and spikes and drops. And I, and I would imagine that at least in um, some of the um, situations, uh, the, the drops were probably due to levels of education and levels of awareness. Um, is that fair to say? Or do you see any, any other explanations as to uh, maybe not necessarily the spikes, but the drops. <clears throat> I wish I knew the answer. I wish somebody knew. Well, still tough. No, I, still I, tough. I think I have some things. For instance, like for instance, um, about ten years ago, if you recall. HPD was ticketing everybody downtown in mm -hmm. Chinatown. You know, all the little Chinese ladies were crossing the street, they were getting tickets for jaywalking. Mm -hmm. And you saw a, an immediate change there. You know, people were being fined for jaywalking, for entering the crosswalk when they were not allowed to. Um, and then all of a sudden you see a change in downtown now. You know, I don't see people jaywalking as much anymore for fear of, yeah. less for fear of getting, more fear of getting a ticket than actually getting hit by a car, I think. Well, yeah. I hate to tell you this, <laughs> but <laughs> we've got some video. Yeah, okay, okay. Right, okay there we go, there we go. And, uh, okay. I, I, I don't know, maybe yeah. this is in the past few weeks or so, but we, uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. we're able to see downtown, quite a yeah. few people. Yeah. But you know, I mean, if you, if you maybe if you think comparatively, um, yeah. you know, what you might see otherwise. And I think some of these areas in downtown too, there's a different vibe to it as far as it almost I think people almost take a little bit of like a park like feel to it because you have a couple of streets here and there that are not for um, traffic only for buses mm -hmm. so I I personally when I'm down there have a di different uh, vibe than I would say elsewhere and in, in my awareness of, of being a responsible pedestrian mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't say I'm, I'm, I'm I've been great about that myself <laughs> uh, but, I was, but, you know. but I was talking more about 10 years ago when this sure. happened I, I saw a change 10 years ago immediately of course we're not always enforcing it all the time now but I, I saw a change immediately then. So, so let's take a, let's kind of break this down a little bit more. So we, we typically, you know, when we, the, the strongest numbers that we do have as far as um, uh, the, the number of um, people being involved usually has to do with either a, a critical accident or fatality. Um, and I, I would imagine when it, in, um, alcohol, intoxication possibly mm -hmm. involved. Where are we as far as the kind of data that we have and or that we need to have to see a greater picture here um, whether it be with people who are just, um, I don't I shouldn't say just injured, but who, who get injured, um, but, but survive. Where are we in sort of extending our data knowledge and being able to use that to our advantage? So as kind of the big kid on the block in law enforcement, the Honolulu Police Department is capturing uh, all that kind of data that we're going to put into police reports. Uh, we're capturing and we're storing it all electronically. And so in the past year or so, uh, we've started to flow that data to DOT. So DOT not, doesn't just get a, a photocopy of a, a police report that they have to manually input information, but they're getting the actual data itself flowed over, which is gr greatly going to improve. Big step in the, the right direction. The, right, the long-term data set that we're going to be able to analyze and look for some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, included in that data are conditions uh, of levels of injury of everyone who's involved, whether they're injured or not, whether they're a passenger, where they're seated in the car, or if they're in a uh, pedestrian, if they're in a marked crosswalk, causative factors, other environmental factors that the officers determine may be um, related to causing or, or impacting the causes of collisions. Uh, so th that kind of data is flowing to DOT now. And DOT, I think Ed can probably speak to this, is, is um, developing a, a really powerful, I think it will become a very powerful database um, of current and historical data that will allow us uh, to kind of pull some of that information out and look at it in specific locations Absolutely. to kind of determine some trends. Definitely. And so we're following HPD's lead, um, making sure that we use this data to ensure that we Shaka can start... program. Yeah. Excuse me. The Shaka right? program. The Shaka exactly. Program. Okay. We started it up last year um, to start flowing the data through, not only from HPD, but also from all the other colonies. To make sure we can start pulling the data in, uh, putting it out um, into a database where we can start targeting all of our resources. Mm -hmm. If our resources were unlimited, we wouldn't need it. We could throw it all over the place. But knowing that we've got to make sure that we're smarter about the way we put out our enforcement, our engineering, and our education, we want to make sure that we understand where we got to target it. So not only the fatalities are we looking at, we're looking at everything that occurs in those areas. If we could get data on the near misses, we'd get those too, to ensure that everything point. is captured. For DOT, we want to be as transparent, as transparent as possible. So if you look on our website, we put out all the information that we use to put out a project online. 
and this Shaka information will be out there as well. So everybody understands where the, the hotspots are, how we're focusing our enforcement and our engineering, and how we're focusing our, focusing our educational pieces. Yeah, we take this information that they give us, and we'll go into those areas <coughs> to reach out to the schools and, and the, the senior centers there just to make sure that we're educating them on good pedestrian behavior because we know we've seen a spike in that area. And mm -hmm. perhaps infrastructure is not quite ready there. Maybe they're fixing some, some things or changing some stuff. So we go in there to change the way they walk. And right now, we're also changing the way people drive. Mm -hmm. So they're, t they're giving us more information about the drivers. Exactly. So we have like, instead of, we have WalkWise Hawaii, and we also have DriveWise Hawaii. So we're trying to change the way drivers pe behave toward pedestrians, and that information helps us out a, well, you a also great have, deal. Yeah. Yeah, excuse yeah. me, but you also have great uh, statistics from the Department of Health. So the Department of Health will collect all that information as to where the pedestrian, cr what's happening as far as pedestrian crashes. Is that more robust? Uh, has it gotten more robust as far as information you're getting? Oh, it is great health? information for so, injury prevention. So yeah. yes, it's great information if you're looking at specific location mm -hmm. and whether an injury occurred or didn't occur. Yes. But outside of that, if it's uh, an issue caused by a motorist, whether the motorist is distracted or not, or if it's uh, at a crosswalk or not a crosswalk, an intersection, not an intersection, that's the kind of data that, that DOT is going to be able to kind of just enhance yes. that that one year worth of map, right? You pull up the, we talked about this, you pull up the Department of Health website, and you're right, it's fabulous data. Yeah. You can click on the last five years and select or deselect uh, vehicles and motorcycles and bicycles and pedestrians, injury collisions. Um, the sad part, and what we talked about was, you look at a year or two's worth of pedestrian injury collisions, and then you take the map away, and the spots just look like the map. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right, but there are layers, you know, you <clears throat> DOT, DOH, and so a lot of information is being collected and it's great that it's being shared. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of how we roll out a safety program. You know, not only that, sorry, one last point on that. Mm -hmm. I think that the point that Ed mm -hmm. made about the data being transparent and available uh -huh. to anyone is really key because it's as much as, as a police officer, as a police manager, um, you know, I'm, I'm on top of it. I know where the collisions are. I know how I'm guiding the enforcement. But to have the public hold elected officials exactly. and public mm -hmm. officials, including HPD, accountable that, hey, if we can see it, you can see it. There's nothing that we have uh, from a data standpoint that the public doesn't have access to. That's very valuable, I think. That's exactly it. And the data allows us to change the mindsets. In the past, when we started looking at engineering solutions for things, we didn't... Um, initiate a project and that project could be a year long could be a year and a half long before construction occurred so two years later you'll get your solution mm -hmm. but in that time frame nothing changed now with that data to show what kind of incidents occurring yeah. at that time real time now we know something has to go in right, right. now something has to go in before that long-term project comes you know through. and that, that's a very good point in, in that even if you're not the the trends aren't necessarily clear at this <clears throat> point just having enough data um, to as a tool to be able to sort of you know initiate action um, that alone Absolutely. I would imagine then kind of leads to some other let me get some of these viewer questions um, so we're talking about getting a little more granular here and <laughs> what we need to be looking at here's one from uh, Mike from Kaimuki are people getting hit wearing dark clothes I, I mean honestly that's a fair question is that is that an issue or you know uh, is uh, black the new uh, everything or <laughs> what's that's, that's a very common yeah. sense you know, question very, and it has a, a very common sense answer the more and Lance will tell you I the more agree. reflective uh, mm -hmm. I mean yeah. no one's gonna yeah. hit Lance no, no, but I shouldn't say no one's going to no hit one's gonna you. Correct. Everybody can be hit no matter what. But yeah, I will right. tell you this, though. I think we have a false sense of security in the in the urban core. That's a very Because good we have point. lights everywhere, right? Point. But as you drive down King Street yep. of Baratania, there's pukas of darkness through there. That's an excellent And I'm many point. times, yeah. I'm always looking for pedestrians always looking for pedestrians and many times I see a flicker of dark going yeah. across in a crosswalk mm -hmm. and I didn't really see that person so we really need to make sure we're visible put on that white shirt yeah. or that cap or the reflective band just so the lights from the car can pick it yeah, up that's a good so point you if, you're, if you're outside of the yeah. intensity of where that light yeah. is yeah. Um, that the, the lighted areas might actually have the opposite effect exactly. in certain parts of the road you should also yeah. know that when you're crossing the street if a person, if a driver is going in your direction and there's cars from the other direction, mm -hmm. those headlights may make you disappear. You know, and that's that's sort of, a, I think, it's come up with it over the past few years, the types of headlights that are on cars now. Mm -hmm. If there's, it, I mean, they're, they're different. Mm -hmm. And um, they're definitely quite <laughs> intense, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is ultimately a good thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's, it's, you know, you, 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 you 
kind of can see two sides of that. Here's another question. Uh, oftentimes the pedestrian and the motorist both have a green light, um, i.e. right turns. Maybe this should change? This is Paco from Maui. Is that something that's been looked at? Absolutely. Um, so there are discussions occurring all the time. If you look at different um, municipalities or different countries on how they, um, how they deal with the situations, really interesting. In Montreal, there are no free right turns. Mm -hmm. Red lights, you stay there until, until it turns green. When it turns green, you go. It's just limiting conflicts. When you start looking at the conflicts, re the reason accidents occur or crashes occur is because there's a conflict point that somebody wasn't paying attention at. Yeah. We started limiting those conflicts. We started limiting the crashes. Yeah, in Western Europe, a lot of times they say that they're, what they're doing is they're, <clears throat> they're banning the right-hand turn on a red, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what um, seems to be um, saving some of the pedestrians. Yeah. They're in a, and I would think that the, the, the education before that Absolutely. is critical yeah. to making sure that happens because yeah, you're creating yeah. the shift that people are not familiar with. Yeah. It's not yeah. part of their pattern. Their yeah, we, we always try to remind yeah. seniors especially to always look for that car that's making the right turn on the red. Mm -hmm. You know, because what happens is you're on the sidewalk, that driver has looked, doesn't see anybody, looks this way, then you enter this crosswalk, <laughs> collision. Yes, yeah. you could have yeah. the right of way, but we, yeah. we tell the seniors, yeah. Do not take a step up, even if you have the right of way, make sure you make eye contact, yeah. even yeah. in broad daylight, mm -hmm. because sometimes the driver is seeing if they can turn right, and you have to make sure you catch their eye before you step out. You know, I, it, I, I, I um, learning how to ride a motorcycle was an important lesson for me, and I think it's something that everybody can kind of wow. take away with, and that, and that you always assume that people do not see mm -hmm. you. You mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. assume mm -hmm. they are not paying attention, no matter what, period. Mm -hmm. And that just should be the, the law of the land. Exactly. Um, and just always look out for yourself. Yeah. Um, let me get to another question here. We have quite a few, actually. Um, I think sort of looking, wondering about the research you've done, as you've mentioned in other areas, and what's been happening. With this question here, do cities with stricter laws from drivers failing to yield to pedestrians see less pedestrian fatalities? Have you guys seen that difference in some of the areas you've looked at? In general, yes. Yeah. If you look at Portland, um, mm -hmm. in Portland, you yield until that driver, I mean that pedestrian, crosses from one side to the other. So it's not, a, uh, in Hawaii, it's half the, half the street. In, in Portland, they got to go all the way across before you move. Okay. So in those areas, the, the fatality rates are down. Um, from that. And in general, yeah. if you look at the, con the questions that are, that are being asked, in general, you can always consider um, mobility and safety um, go up and down together. If you, the, the, the more safe you are, the safer your rules are, the less mobility you'll have. The more b mobility you have, in general, the less safety you'll have because now you increase conflicts. In general, that's what happens. We always play the balance, and in the past, the balance was towards mobility. It's shifting, though. It's shifting tremendously if you see the, the types of policies that the city, the counties, and the state are putting out now. Here's another question from um, Dave and Mo'ili Ili. Does the panel think, um, and maybe this is an HP, HPD question, does the panel think that an updated program of cameras at all red lights would make a difference, especially if running a red light gives an automatic fine? Where, where are you guys at with So that? I know that's something that the, uh, the legislature is probably going to introduce again. It mm -hmm. seems to be a kind of an <laughs> annual introduction. Um, you know, I mean, we have, as a department, we don't have any opposition to it, I don't think. I think uh, from a law enforcement and kind of like a, a procedural court judiciary kind of standpoint, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that any law we do decide to create uh, avoid some pitfalls, right? We want to make sure that uh, the driver is someone who can be identified as opposed to the owner of the car having somehow this legal responsibility That's to identify the driver. That was point. a big issue before, yeah. right? Uh, we that. need to make sure that if, if we do go forward with something like a red light camera or a speed camera, that the, the back to Ed's point of transparency, that mm -hmm. there is transparency in the program in that the, the vendor who gets selected doesn't make more the more citations they issue, mm -hmm. which whether they're the point, yeah. reasonable or unreasonable citations, the perception will, will probably guide the conversation. Exactly. So we're going to absolutely support it when it comes through, because for us, uh, from the DOT's perspective, when we see more enforcement, um, we see more, more people acting the way they're supposed to. In general, when um, you see a police officer around, in general, your behavior is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So if there's, um, <laughs> what? if there's, um, if you know there's red light running cams, yes. in general, yeah. you'll, you'll adhere to yeah. the rules a lot more. And if your penalties increase, I, I mean, if you told people, if we catch you uh, running a red light, we're gonna revoke your license, you'd get, oh, you boy. really would have enforcement. You, you know, that's an idea, but mm -hmm. what if I told you, if you touch your cell phone while you're driving, we're gonna charge you $300 each time. That hasn't helped. Mm. There's more people. It's $297 if you 
controlling your mobile electronic device while you're driving a car. $300 is a lot of money. I mean, I'm a police officer on a civil servant's <laughs> salary. I don't have $300 to pay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I can't tell you the, the uh, you know, the desire doesn't strike me while I'm driving to grab my phone. Mm -hmm. And a penalty of $300 mm -hmm. is, is tons compared to a speeding citation. Mm -hmm. So it, you, it goes back you, to a tipping you, point, yeah. right? What the public yes. is willing to accept um, and what versus what the consequences you know, are and I what wonder, kind of consequences though, that's, they're willing to you know, There's a little bit of a different situation possibly that in that, uh, that there's this sense for people when it's within the car, when it's within yeah. the vehicle, something's happening within it, right. their ability to be able to um, <laughs> overcome adversity um, yeah. is, is higher, even if it's perception. And then also the, the resources I would think that it would take to be able to enforce that to a level that people would feel it, I would think it would be tougher we, to do. We all think we're above average drivers, yeah. but by definition, we can't all be above <laughs> average, right? I mean, that's just how statistics work. A large majority of us are average drivers, and for every above average driver, there's a below average driver. And you take what, even five or 10 years ago, and I don't think this is reflected in the statistics, but you take five or 10 years ago, the demands of daily life, and what you were thinking about and what you were doing on mm -hmm. your way to work. And you compare that with today, right? We live in a, an age where everyone feels the need to be immediately available all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that includes while they're driving, whether that be by text message or phone or checking emails or Facebook or whatever people are doing with their phones, the demands and society has changed and, and the socially acceptable behavior has changed along with it. You need, you look at the uh, University of Hawaii. For so many people, the, the, the car has become their workplace. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. sure. Yeah. You, when I'm driving my kids <laughs> to work and school, yeah. I have to multitask right. because I've got 10 things going on. You look at the study from the University of Hawaii when they, look, they measure seatbelts. They've begun looking at mobile electronic devices as well. Their statistics are going to tell you that our, our mobile electronic device use is in decline. And I would argue that on free-flowing free freeways or roadways, that might be the case. But what happens on, in the morning, right? I live in Waianae and I work in town, so I sit in an hour and a half of traffic every day. And as soon as I get to the Cunha off, boom, I'm at a dead stop. You look to your left, you look to your right, pass one car on either side, I guarantee you within those four cars, at least somebody is on their phone texting. Yep. And what happens? That keeps them from moving forward, which keeps the person behind them, exactly. and it's a gigantic accordion effect. It's yeah. self fulfilling prophecy. But isn't there a prophecy. pain point where you say the behavior will change? Isn't there something where you think <clears throat> something has to change? Because if people say it doesn't matter what the penalty is, I'm still going to be texting, I'm still not going to pay attention. There has to be a point where you know there, this is going to change behavior. And that's why I said in some countries where they said, you do this, we will revoke your license. It, they pay attention. And that's why I agree with Ed. You see a police car, you see a police <laughs> officer somewhere, you're really going to be a lot more careful. Okay, here's an interesting yeah. question um, from one of the viewers. Um, uh, believing that drivers are not trained as well as they used to be, that there used to be extensive driving classes and simulators. Now the driver's test is so basic that new drivers do not fully learn all the rules and good driving habits. That's from Roger in Lanai. What's your, what's your two cents on that? Um, he's saying, hey, this, things have changed. It's, it's, or maybe, or maybe um, even if the driving standard is standard or average for the country, are we at a, at a point where it needs to be more robust because of the way people are driving and operating in their cars now? Uh, That's a what, really what good question. I, well, it's been a long time since I took the test, right? So <laughs> Not that long. Yeah. <laughs> has, the, has the, has the yeah, test yeah, yeah. changed yeah. at all, yeah. for point of better or for worse, however you want to put it, in, in any shape or form in recent years? I don't, I don't recall. Actually, the has requirements, actually, yeah. to get the, the requirements to get your license mm -hmm. um, increased, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. you got to go through um, driver's ed. Um, there's a time frame that you you got to get uh, so many hours of driving training with, with a licensed driver. And when you get your license, there's um, a time frame where you cannot have anybody in the vehicle that's not in your family um, under 21. Has that changed then in Hawaii? These here? are, these are there changes. Were, there that, were tougher, uh, stricter laws in the mainland. Yeah, so the, these are changes in Hawaii yeah. that, that were instated a while ago. Um, and it's made things a lot safer. Mm -hmm. um, I would contend that the, the crashes that are occurring are not necessarily the newer drivers. They're the ones that are actually following the rules. Um, it's those like us that's been driving for a while who believe we got it um, that are causing crashes good. right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I'm seeing. You've had enough. Uh, <laughs> your misses. You're confident. Here. Yeah, and that's maybe a, a, yeah. to, to to your point about uh, about increasing the data and the different levels mm -hmm. of data that we have to maybe then start to kind of tease out 
some of the trends that we're looking for. Maybe it's, it's going to need needs to get to that point based yeah. on how. Yeah. Our I've always wanted to know what the operating. age of the drivers are yeah. that are hitting. You know, especially when seniors get hit, mm -hmm. are other seniors hitting seniors? You know, I'd like to know if that's if is that is that is that something we're going to learn one day? You mm -hmm. know, is it younger seniors hitting older seniors? You know, what age group is hitting people or not paying attention? Mm -hmm. You know, we always get the numbers of the pedestrian ages right. that, are, that die, but I never know the age of the drivers. And I think yeah. then you know if alcohol is involved because mm -hmm. an overwhelming amount of number of people who are hit are involved in alcohol related crashes. But we also see um, impaired pedestrians. Then right? that's yeah. a thing. Pedestrians right? so, too. Yeah. If you look at the yeah. numbers, about 55% of fatalities annually yeah. are alcohol or drug related. Mm -hmm. But that's on both sides. You know, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was I think one of the discussions um, I had with the producers earlier was okay, we hear we hear so much and we just kind of make the assumption um, almost naturally at this point that oh well gee I wonder what the driver did mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if the driver was intoxicated I wonder if the driver wasn't paying attention which I'm sure um, oftentimes is the case but I'm I, I'm curious as to the the amount of data that we have and, and what we can share about what may be happening on the other side are we they're both at fault yeah. and that's the truth they're both at fault the pedestrian and the driver in Hawaii is right is following the trend that you see on the mainland where over 50% of the pedestrian crashes involve alcohol or drugs. On I, yeah, I want to be careful mm -hmm. when we yeah. talk about that because one of the factors to consider is that data comes from FARS, right? Fatal accident. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the correct. federal system. Yeah, yeah. The federal Far. system, right? Yeah. So FARS yeah. collects data from autopsies and toxicology of people that die uh, and also evidentiary toxicology if a driver is involved who gets arrested, for instance, right? Um, so that data is if anyone involved in the collision, whether it be, let's say a car hits a pedestrian and the pedestrian uh, has alcohol or drugs in their system, regardless of fault, that's gonna be considered, uh, if a sober driver uh, runs a red light and hits a pedestrian who has alcohol or drugs in their system, that will be considered an alcohol or drug related fatality. So we need to draw a distinction between alcohol and drug related and alcohol and drug impaired. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the other factor in that is the more um, senior citizen pedestrians uh, are involved in collisions. Senior citizens, by definition, well, not by definition, no. <laughs> luckily, knock on wood one day, I'll be one um, very soon. Uh, but the older you get, the more medications you take, right? To live a normal, as a generally yeah. speaking, to live a normal, uh, productive life. Um, people who get older take more chemicals to help them live normal, productive lives. And whether or not those people are impaired or not by chemical substances, they're still being flagged as drug related. Mm -hmm. So a 70 year old pedestrian who gets hit by a 20 year old sober driver in a crosswalk, regardless of fault, regardless of causation, regardless of impairment, if the, if the pedestrian has some sort of chemical in their system, that's gonna be drug related. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of questions here that are pretty similar and it's gonna to relate to some video that we have here along the uh, Pauly Highway. And I'll just kind of, I'll kind of mm -hmm. piggyback these two on this long question, so bear with me. Um, um, Allison calling in and saying, I find the placement of crosswalks to be the most frustrating as a driver. Uh, there are many multi-lane roads, not near any intersection, cars parked along the side, uh, other cars on the other side impaired in some way. Um, so she's seeing all kinds of problems here. To see someone on the sidewalk while they're preparing to cross the street. And then also Jeff and Kailua here talking about um, the Pulley Highway, King Street, and the uh, crosswalks there. I think they got some video there um, that have, um, and, you know, and Jeff saying, hey, if we're going to have this, what we're seeing here, see on the Pulley Highway where we had, the, I think, the fatality recently, that, that, that really should be a stoplight, um, at least in some people's perspective, that that's kind of a death trap. Um, I, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? What's the reality? We're seeing some of the measures that have happened recently with, um, I'm forgetting what those, um, uh, the posts that have gone up, mm -hmm. yeah. Delaney, Delaney, Delaney. Delaney. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, where, where, where is the, the thought process right now as far as how far we need to go in areas such as this, so, um, the pulley here? So areas like this, when we start looking at facilities, <clears throat> first thing we look at, do we really need the crosswalk there? Mm -hmm. First thing. Uh, what, what drives the crosswalk to be there um, and is it really necessary? In these cases, absolutely. There's bus stops in the area. The next, the nearest crosswalks that are protected are more than a thousand feet away. So definitely it's necessary for mobility uh, for pedestrians in that area. Second, we look at how we can protect them better. If there's no stoplight there that's protecting it, what can we do? Definitely a stoplight is the best solution, but that's two years out. It's a nine month time frame to make sure that we order it, another two, uh, three months to ensure that it's designed correctly. So it's a year out before you even start construction. Mm -hmm. We gotta do something now. 
So when we started looking at these, these tactics to put in, um, Michigan, the state of Michigan's DOT, started putting these in in their university areas. When they started putting them in, they saw that the, the yield rate for, for drivers in pedestrian areas went up 65%. Very cheap, very easy to put up. We can put them up in a, in a couple of hours. That's something we can do right now while we start looking at the next solutions. In these areas, we start looking at those flashers, and everybody thinks that's the yeah, key. Yeah, I think we Put have up. some stuff on uh, yeah. King Street, some video of that as yeah. well. Yeah, so the, the flashers, um, everybody thinks that's the one you, you put up. It's better yeah. than a stoplight because I don't have to stop all the time. It's only when the pedestrian hits it. In reality, when you look at it nationally, when you look at high volume, high speed facilities, the flashers work for the first couple of weeks. And after that, everybody's conditioned for it. Really? So in general, it actually makes it more dangerous because if a person hits the flasher, by law, you don't have to stop. You start walking across, be thinking that you're safe. It could be actually make you make it a da more dangerous situation for you. So, the, mm -hmm. the viewer is correct. The I think we did have some video on <coughs> yeah, that, by please. the way. That was um, yeah, King Street video. So yeah, that, that's very <coughs> interesting. I I, I I think that's still, um, <coughs> you know, the um, go. the thought process that, that that this is something that's a good measure, mm -hmm. but uh, but. In this particular case, you're finding out this is not necessarily the right answer. It's and not turning out to have good results as opposed to the delineators. And for us, when we start looking at poly, mm -hmm. um, it's a 35 mile per hour speed limit there. When you start looking at the, the speed of that facility, how many people are actually going 35? Yeah. So right now, when we start looking at the gateways concepts, it's slowing people down for now. And we're going to start in, improving it to ensure that we keep people slowing down in that area until such time that we can get a positive protection on I have to play a little bit of devil's yeah, advocate yeah. here because if, if you think about that that crosswalk um, or some of the long crosswalks on the Pulley Highway, they've been there for a very long time. So if you're saying, okay, it takes a couple of years for these lights to go in, we've known about this being a problem area for many years. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't they have? So we've taken the steps now? in the past. Okay. DOT has taken the steps, and I'm speaking for DOT in general. In the past, the speed, the speed issues were addressed. There were um, speed humps that were put, or speed bumps, those little the rumble mm -hmm. strips that were put in. It slowed people down coming down. Uh, the people who normally use that route are those coming from the windward side to get to town. So that's their travel route to get there. Um, speed bump, those rumble strips are put in, and it slowed people down coming down the hill. Uh, it worked well until um, there was complaints about the noise that was generated. Interesting. By the <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, really? Yeah. 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 Back yeah. to that tipping point. Yeah. What is yeah. the public willing yeah. to accept? Exactly. Yeah. So those, those, those rumble strips had to come out because wow. the complaint right. went to the Department of Health who, who regulates noise pollution. Wow. The volumes so, okay, so I have to ask that. Is, is that, um, okay, yeah, the public's upset about it and <clears throat> the public, they're voters, mm -hmm. but is, is there a certain <clears throat> level of um, uh, increasing of tolerance that maybe politicians have to be able to handle knowing that if this is helping in some shape or form or is it just not that simple of an answer? No, you're asking yeah, a table yeah. full of public safety. Yeah. 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 So we're all going to say yes. Yeah. 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 I'm making this, this too easy. So, so the answer is yeah. absolutely yes. Yeah. yes. From, from our perspective and again in general in the past mobility was king on the roads. Mm -hmm. That's going away. So in areas where you're seeing, where, where we've seen traditionally higher speeds, uh, then then is it, then is uh, allowable, um, and a lot of pedestrian volume, you're going to see changes. So on Kalia Street, we're going to be putting in raised pedestrian um, crosswalks. Really, what that is is a speed Great. table. So when you get to that speed table, if you go with the speed limit, the 25 mile per hour speed limit in that area, your car will be fine. If you go faster, the bottom of your car will get busted up. I mean, that's, that's just what's going to happen. And then self-interest, because we love those elevated crosswalks. <clears throat> they have them in Kaka'ako. And because it's, <clears throat> it has to do with vested interest, I think. Because if you think your car is going to get damaged that's by speeding, that's a great point. That's why we like it, because we think <clears throat> the driver is going to look at these, this traffic calming tool and say, mm -hmm. I can't afford to repair my car. I'm going to slow down. So you have that, you have yeah. the roundabouts, you think, I'm not, I don't want my tires, my tire rims hitting the curb or going around that roundabout. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you make it important for the driver, they have some skin in the game, you see a change in behavior. 
I see a lot of head nodding. Yeah. <laughs> that it's makes true. perfect sense. Mine, yeah. yeah. mine included. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Mine included. Okay, all right, here's a question for another um, people wondering about some other um, initiatives if they've worked. Uh, Kristen um, from Twitter. Last year, there was a school pilot program in which pedestrians used bright flags and bins placed at both sides of the crosswalk. I've seen this yeah. in many yeah. other cities as well. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you see from that? Do you see it working? Did you see, how did that? You know, um, so there's a couple of things we see. Um, and. The Hawaii Bicycling League has been championing this in different communities. Uh, Leeward Coast has quite a bit of them. Mm -hmm. uh, when in areas where they saw unprotected crosswalks, they put those bins in across the, on, on both sides. And what we've seen is when a person takes the flag out, they're taking the responsibility to be safe. When they start waving the flag, they don't just grab it and walk. You'll see them grab the flag, they'll start taking a look, and they'll make sure that somebody sees them. That's all we're asking for from everybody. So whether it takes the flag to do it, whether it takes um, a person just doing it without the flag, that's fine, as long as that awareness is there and they're taking the responsibility on them. I think it's wonderful when they do the flags, but the community has to do the flags, right? So private groups have to maintain those <coughs> flags. And I think on the Waina Coast, they did it for a while, and it was great, you know, they, every single crosswalk had flags, and community groups were helping. And then after three or four months, the community groups stopped fixing the flags, and all of a sudden you had less flags. And the flags were stolen, mm -hmm. and they were gone, right? And then all of a sudden then, you know, the community and forgets the about thing, it, right? I was in Seattle for a while, yeah. and they had a similar problem right. where people yeah. were taking yeah. all yeah. the so, flags. You know, so. And you, you need champions yeah. at every crosswalk. Interesting solutions yeah. for this. Yeah. Uh, the city is looking at right now, the, their Department of Transportation Services. Instead of putting the flags out on the streets, giving the flags to people, nope. but maybe in different ways. Oh, yeah. So okay. instead of, instead of a, a stick with a flag on the end of it, one of those folded up fan mm -hmm. type of things. Right, if it's some are, big old thing, I can't yeah. imagine yeah. putting that in my purse on my way to work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of those folded work. up things that are yeah. bright orange that you can unfold and use while you go across the street, excellent idea. That's a, that's a great idea. Have you seen that I elsewhere? That. In other, I don't know if no, seen I there. haven't seen anybody yeah. hand out. So they, they'd All right, be, there you go, brand it. Now it's first. Yes, that's <laughs> idea. Yeah, I hate to be the donor here. I hate to drag everybody back to reality. It's a real conversation. Regardless if we have a flag or a reflective device or wearing Ed's yellow shirt, <laughs> it all comes back to what we talked about at the very beginning, right? The central thing we keep hovering around with all these panacea ideas, which are great and can contribute to something. But at the end of the day, we, there has to be some sort of understanding between motorists and pedestrians. And everyone's a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. People in cars and people who are not in cars, maybe. That we are in this together and everyone does have a vested interest. And exactly. until we get to that point, which is the zero deaths concept, right? That's what we're, we would like to get to eventually. But until then, everyone can have a flag and everyone can have, and yes, maybe it might in certain areas improve or, or eliminate certain collisions. But if we're really talking about a solution, like a long term realistic solution, um, these are great steps along the way. But I think we need to keep our eye on the ultimate prize, which is we have to be looking out for each other. We have to realize, we have to make eye contact. It goes back to your point you yeah. made at the very beginning. When I teach my kids who are you know, eight and 10 years old to walk across the street, yes, they hold my hand. They're gonna be embarrassed because they heard me say it on TV. <laughs> but I tell them, yeah. you make yeah. eye contact with that driver and you do not step off the curb yes. until you make eye contact. They look at yeah. you, they wave. Yes. If not, you just wait. We, it's not worth it. We actually say, can make eye contact and say mahalo or wave, yep. so you say, yeah, you okay. Ask, you know yeah, but you have yeah, to see the person. not looking beyond you somewhere. But right. I'm going to take this a little step further. Um, so when we're telling people to cross the street, especially if it's a mid-block crosswalk, and the driver in, in lane one stops to let you cross the street, you need to make sure that you get the eye contact of every driver in that street. What happens mm -hmm. is many times is you give First the one. right of way, yep. yep. you're in the yep. big SUV. Oh boy, did I, I've seen that a lot on King Street. The street <laughs> yeah. Has a false sense uh -huh. of security walks yes. all the way here, you're in lane three, you're stopping as well, I'm in lane two, I'm in a rush, yes. I'm tired of this guy been stopping all the time, and I come around, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and so we always tell everybody, look lane by lane, <clears throat> you know, just because this driver says yes, it doesn't mean it's safe all the way across. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you know, uh, to the captain's point, what we have to do is find a solution faster, because yeah. this population yeah, right. is aging, and when yeah. you look at the population, about 20% of our seniors do not drive anymore. And we, AARP did a survey and they said, and what came in was astounding. They said 50% of the people who took the survey said they were afraid, they thought it was dangerous to cross the street in their own neighborhood. So it is not just Ford Street Mall, you know, the clip you showed. They're yeah. talking about their own neighborhoods that they can't cross safely. Okay. So this is a problem because one out of every four persons is going to be 
over the age of 62 by 2030. So this leads to a question from Lloyd here from Wai'anae saying, would driving tests of all drivers, say every 10 years, be worth doing? Has that ever been considered? Have you mm -hmm. seen that happen elsewhere where it's just, uh, yeah. that's it. We're, we're going to do this incrementally. I know we do vision screening, but yeah. that's yeah. where we, that's one of the limitations. Yeah. Um, autonomous cars. Yeah. Um, yes. Autonomous driving cars. I, well, what's the we? I don't know if there's been any pilot programs here. I don't remember. We haven't had any yet, and um, but we're, we are pushing for them. Um, for autonomous vehicles, right now it's it's being seen as the panacea. But if you look at the data right now, they're no safer than normal vehicles yet. You know, the the, the devil devil's advocate question I would have with that is. If we're talking about issues with people disconnecting mm -hmm, um, from being in their cars and how it's operating, and then you know <laughs> this, this trajectory that's sort of happening mm -hmm. very quickly and weighs a whole lot of uh, pounds, if we then kind of move to that level of disconnect, mm -hmm. um, what uh, what are we creating here? I know I know there's definitely an, an argument to it's safer because you're you're automating your you know it's it's it has the, all these different measures in place, but. Um, so, where do, how does that sit with everybody? So, for, mm -hmm. for full autonomy, it's not just autonomy; it's, it's connectivity. When all vehicles and all, all vehicles are connected to vehicles, and all vehicles are connected to the infrastructure, then you have real safety. That's a long way off. In the interim, we have um, semi-autonomy. We got cars that sense other cars around you that'll brake for you and those types of things. From my perspective, um, in general, it'll make some situations safer. It'll stop people from some crashes that they that mm -hmm. might get into. Um, in other cases, I'm a little bit worried about it because because people have these sensors now, they may think that they don't have to be as aware yeah. as they were before. And that's my Are concern. there some pilot projects coming down the road? Is anybody aware of that? I'm just curious. <coughs> um, I know in some cities they are starting to roll those out. Um, not that here. Has, has yeah. not, not here, here but here yes, in other cities. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is from Irene, um, getting to the education uh, of things, whether it be kids or the population as a whole. We need to educate kids as well as foreign people outside of the U.S. who don't always know how to cross the street properly. And this is kind of, here's another, I'm going to come, these don't pair perfectly well together, but this is from um, uh, Anana Maui. He says, it's both driver and pedestrian responsibility. Uh, both the pedestrian and the driver need to communicate with each other. You talked about yes. that, um, Barbara, to make eye contact in Japan. They say um, drivers honk politely at pedestrians and crosswalks to acknowledge that they see them. But people have an issue with honking here. Yeah, yeah. 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 You should not yeah. honk. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. to um, ethnicity, for instance. Yeah. So Walkwise Hawaii, we realize that we have many ethnicities here in the state. You know, so our brochure is in Japanese, Korean, um, Tagalog, you know, a, a variety of languages. And we also realize that the the, um, the way of walking in different Asian countries is different than in the U.S., right? right. There's some yeah. countries where you just walk and the cars will go around you. You know, that's the whole idea, right? So that's why we made we made a big point to reach out to the, the, the Chinese-American community and the Filipino community, you know, and uh, just to, so they understood that here you need to look left, right, and left again and make eye contact. Don't assume that it's safe, you know. So we've been reaching out to that, but I don't think um, visitors very rarely get hit by a car here, right? That's true. Yeah, very rarely does a visitor yes. to the state of Hawaii get hit well, again, by a vehicle, the, right? It yeah. goes back to the data. I, I couldn't yeah. tell you. Yeah. I could tell you that very rarely do visitors yeah. get critically injured or critically killed. Critically injured, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the data that I'm is super correct. familiar yeah. with. Mm -hmm. But yeah. as far as yeah. injury collisions yeah. and or near non misses, yeah, collisions. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's the thing. You know, you talk about the crashes that end in fatalities, yeah. but you really have to look at the number of crashes that happen that change a person's life forever, their health forever, and so the quality of their life and, and I really think that for every pedestrian fatality, you have hundreds of people who have had crashes with cars or bicycles or some kind of, or a moped, but some kind of vehicle. So what else, um, so, so looking, looking, looking ahead, I know we're all kind of touching on some different areas that, that you're exploring and, and are starting to implement. Um, what else can you share about, um, um, we talked about building the databases and getting a little bit more granular and, and layered with uh, the information that we mm -hmm. do have. How, how, how else are you moving forward? What else are you looking at that you think is important to, to get deeper into or that needs to happen within this community? From the police department standpoint, again, our, our role and responsibility is kind of to enforce, right, and to investigate, and that's kind of the main thrust behind our, our, uh, our purpose. But 
we're definitely into thinking outside the box, right? I don't, I don't know if you followed or not, but I had police officers dressing up as a Grim Reaper, right? Mm -hmm. And popping up the month before Halloween and passing out candy at crosswalks, right? People who cross well got lifesavers or smarties and um, <laughs> coincidentally hey, people who it did it got dum-dums. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, um, it's clever. Yeah. So it, I mean, any yeah, kind of outside the box mm -hmm. kind of awareness raising thing, we're into it and we're, we're open to it. Um, and then you flip the, the switch the other way, we're going to give probably 10,000 pedestrian violation citations this year, which I wish we didn't have to give any, but again, it goes back to Barbara's point about how, what's the tipping point, right? What's the pain threshold that we have to administer? And again, we have people, police officers in plain clothes walking across the street and other police officers waiting down the road to stop motorists who don't stop for pedestrians. So it, it's outside the box and it's a little... I don't know, it's a little tricky maybe, but at the same time, if people are aware and it makes them think twice, then from our perspective, that's kind of what we're going for. On the education side, we want to change the answer to this question. When I ask seniors or people that are over 40, you know, what do you do before you cross the street? And they go, oh, I look both ways and I cross the street. When I ask younger, when we ask children in the state of Hawaii, what do you do when you cross the street? They go, oh, I look left, I look right, I look left. Again, really? they continue yeah. looking. So we're trying to change the behavior. So hopefully in this next generation, they'll be much more, they'll pay much more attention You're when crossing seeing the street. More consistency. We're, we're seeing some consistency to it. So I hope when I ask someone of your age, or your age, or your age one day, um, we that they will you. say, they, <laughs> Wait, you know, they will, be polite. So, yeah. so no, we, need to, we really need to change that, you know, and yeah. I think also when you get behind the wheel of your car, put your phone away and say, my job is to get from point A to point B safely, you know, and put everything away and just concentrate on driving. You know, it's a privilege to drive, you know, pay attention, right? From the facility side, um, we wish that this culture shift occurred so that everybody started taking care of everybody. These accidents came down tremendously to that zero point that we're looking at. If they don't, then the facility is going to change tremendously. Like I talked about, safety and mobility on a sliding scale. So if we can't get the safety we, we want with the mobility that we're providing right now, we'll reduce the mobility to get the safety up. So we'll see more speed humps, we'll see more areas with res restricted turns until such time that we, we eliminate those conflicts that lead to these crashes. We don't want to do it. We don't want to um, slow people down in their commutes to where they want to go. But if it's going to save lives, we'll do it. Well, ARP doesn't believe in luck. Uh, it's, you know, our record shows that it's so dangerous. You shouldn't have to cross your fingers to cross the street safely. You just should be safe. And so uh, we are thrilled. We're absolutely thrilled with Honolulu, with uh, Mayor Caldwell and the initiative that the uh, Honolulu Council passed in October, that's now law, that requires every single department to look at how to improve the livability and safety of whatever they're responsible for. For, so, for something like the Department of Transit Services, they have to look at what is it that's going to make it safer to be out in the community, whether you're talking about crossing the street, the sidewalks, they, are, they have to look at it and what part of their budget is going to be appropriated for that. And on top of that, they have to put it on the website. So in their annual report and part of the general plan, every department is required to look at what makes it safer for anything that they do. This is a tremendous bill. This is the model bill that's being, being looked at by all of the cities, so I think and we're the one, first to pass it. I think this is, that's excellent. I think that maybe this is one initiative from uh, Professor uh, Crawford here, saying that this has to do with pedestrian footwear. Uh, caller would like the panel to address if they think people wearing slippers, no, rephrase, slippers, uh, slippers <laughs> yeah, yeah, here, yeah, yeah, make yeah. pedestrians have a more relaxed state of mind. <clears throat> um, and maybe if that should, is this, an, is this what we could kind of have as one of the initiatives? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that's going to go over very well. No. I don't think so. Hard to give up I think a person can safely walk across <laughs> the street um, in their slippers. And make it across, as, you know. I that, think, yeah, that, I think it's a bigger issue than that. Yeah. Uh, blind spots uh, in cars. I wanted to kind of ask about this one, too. I, I don't know how much, you know, we could do uh, on, on a local level, but it makes you think about, you know, what you would ask of your um, your representatives on uh, on a federal or national level, whether if that's an issue or if you if you're noticing that in any shape or form, because of the type of vehicles we're driving in now. Mm -hmm. And I admit I, I had a small um, uh, car before and I have an SUV now, and I honestly feel like 
I have a little bit of a tougher time mm -hmm. seeing out of mm -hmm. my vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. You look at especially critical and fatal collisions yeah. that with pedestrians in crosswalks, now narrowing it down, that's pretty far, but most of those are A-pillar collisions, meaning mm -hmm. the driver and the pedestrian were separated by the A-pillar of the car. So the A-pillar is going to be the, between the front windshield and the driver's window, or the front windshield and the, the passenger's front window, that very first pillar in the front of the car. So that is part of your thought process, yep. that that Absolutely. might indeed be an issue. Absolutely. Because boy, are those cars, cars popular these days. Yeah. But you know, we yeah. do have car fit um, seminars or workshops where uh, members of the public can come, and we work on this with um, occupational therapist group, and the person comes in, comes up and they say, okay, can you see me here? And if you can't, they adjust a mirror. They look at the person and sometimes a person over the years doesn't realize maybe they're a little shorter. <laughs> so they, they look yeah, at yeah, the raising the seat. <laughs> yeah. They said the steering yeah. wheel is a little bit too far and they That's adjust that. That's a good that. point yeah. too. Their body, they, body change yeah. and is, they yeah. think that they still fit the car the same way. Yeah. And so That's there's a, a checklist a and you have to be able to see everything on that checklist and, the, and they adjust you to your car. That's so wonderful. we encourage so them it's to just like seatbelt safety for kids yes. and booster seats right. safety Absolutely. for seniors. Same that thing. is very smart. Right. Yeah. 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 Being aware yeah. of, of your, how your environment is changing and how you are changing. You're changing. Well, thank you so much. We got a massive stack of questions because obviously this is an important yes. issue to, to everybody. And, and we're so grateful that all of uh, you are here. So mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight and thanking our guests. Honolulu Police Captain Ben Moskowitz, uh, Lance Ray with Walkwise Hawaii, Ed Sniffen from the State Department, Transportation Department, and Barbara Kim Stanton from AARP. All right, next week on Insights, we'll take a closer look at the city's newly released environmental impact study that proposes to restore most of the Waikiki Natatorium. A long conversation about this one. So join us for this conversation about this iconic landmark. I'm Laurie Mata for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Home.